Hello everyone. Uh, this is the second lecture of the uh, physics module in the mini course on computation. And today we're going to talk about quantum and gravitational theory. So just a recall, last time we talked about Newton's law and classical mechanics and uh, statistical mechanics and their relation to computation. And today we are going to cover more uh, modern topics, yeah, especially on quantum and uh, gravitational theory. So what are quantum and gravity? Basically, they are like the two extremes uh, in the world where quantum is in the, the, the microscopic scale and gra gravity is about the, the very super large scales, uh, like a theory of understanding motion of big objects. And today, I hope to let, give you a taste and a feeling about the relation of computation and, uh, and these two theories. And uh, since uh, actually there are a lot to cover, and I actually also want to give you a sense of the fundamental stuff. So this will be like a roller coaster ride, and I actually hate to do this. Yeah, so indeed, in this ride, you will feel lots of uncomfortableness, but I encourage you to stay with me. Yeah, and ask as many questions as possible. All the questions will be answered in later. Yeah, but uh, don't give up. Yeah, and I'll try to make it as approachable as possible. So let's start with uh, quantum mechanics, which is a theory about the microscopic world. So why quantum? Yeah, the actually the initial motivation of studying like a quantum mechanics, like a, as a kind of like a replacement of how we seen uh, yesterday, is like there are phenomena that cannot be explained by like classical mechanics. In particular, in classical mechanics, the world is kind of continuous in the sense that if you remember, we talk about different worldview. Yeah, the geometrical space, yeah, classical mechanics discuss is super continuous. But in the real world, people observe lots of uh, discreteness. Yeah, for example, there are some physical quantity that take discrete values, which we will see in a minute in the next slide. Also, there are some objects that behave both like particle and wave at the same time, roughly at the same time. And this is not really allowed in classical mechanics. And classical mechanics thinks it's particle. And there's another field like study like electromagnetic stuff. It is talking about wave. And the two is not really like allowing the same things to be the both particle and wave at the same time. So quantum physics basically is like a, a theory trying to explain like, uh, for example, these two phenomena that classically cannot uh, explain well. To be more concrete, let me use this uh, textbook uh, experiment about stern uh experiments. So in this experiment, we can see both the quantization of uh, some physical quantity as well as the particle wave uh, duality of some objects. So imagine now you have a furnace, which is a fancy name for oven, which uh, like heat up uh, like silver atoms and emit them. And you will emit them through like a magnetic field, which you can just imagine you put some magnetics on top and bottom so that there are some direction here. In particular, what you will do is that if your silver atoms have some angular momentum, you will push it either up or down according to whether the angular momentum is plus or minus. And the distance you push it up and down will be proportional to the angular momentum of this uh, silver atoms. And angular momentum, you can just think of it as a physical quantity. So if you are working in classical mechanics, yeah, people will predict that, oh, all the atoms, like uh, all the possible values of angular momentum might have a corresponding atoms because this furnace basically mess up everything. So like uh, every choice probably is, uh, could, could happen. But what people observe in real life is like, there's actually just two, two possible uh, so like observation, yeah, which corresponding to there are only two possible angular momentums of those uh, silver atoms like uh, emitted from this furnace. So this is saying that the angular momentum actually is not a continuous quantity. Yeah, it only can take discrete value. So this is not, this cannot be explained by like uh, classical mechanics. 
And furthermore, there are like this wave particle duality you can see from this experiment. And for simplicity, let me call this uh, device uh, SG, SG, stand for the experiment, and Z is the direction of the uh, magnetic field. So what we did here basically is like we, we use the oven to emit some silver atoms to SGZ and we know we will have two possible outcomes. So let's do a salt experiment by blocking the minus moment, angular momentum atoms. Yeah, and then uh, pass it through another SGZ. Yeah, so uh, not surprisingly, yeah, only uh, SGZ plus the plus moment, angular momentum uh, atom will survive because we already block out the minus one. Okay, but now let's do the experiment again. And instead of uh, feeding the SG, SZ plus, the plus angular momentum one into SGZ, we change the direction of the magnetic field to the X axis. Yeah, and interestingly, the result becomes uh, SX plus and X minus. And SX plus just stands for the angular momentum in the x direction is positive, and this is negative angular momentum in the x direction. Okay, and finally, the most interesting thing happened here. It's like, okay, now we, we block SZ, SZ minus and fit into SGZ x. We know there will, there will be two uh, outcome, and we, we fed them into SGZ again, the original direction, yeah. So the possible outcome is like, uh, oh, you will, might also go back to the angular momentum in the z direction. There could be the plus angular momentum also minus. And it turns out that both will happen. So the mysterious things here is like, uh, in the beginning, we block out all the uh, minus angular momentum in the z direction, but it happens, uh, it show up again in the, in the end. And this is some pr property if you are particles, it shouldn't happen. It should be a wave so that it can happen. But uh, atom, uh, silver atoms, people regard it as like a, a particle for a long time. So hope this uh, experiment that you have a feeling of the starting point of uh, quantum physics. So basically quantum mechanics is then a theory try to explain in this kind of phenomenon, like the quantization of physical quantity and wave particle duality. So from now on, I'm going to move on from experiments and talk a little bit about how uh, physicists set up the mathematical worlds for studying this kind of uh, phenomenon. So first, how to model the quantization and discreteness of physical quantity. Yeah, so the beautiful jump, yeah, from the previous uh, world view we see yesterday, yeah, is to use coordinate, yeah, the, the dimension of the mathematical space to encode uh, to encode your 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 possible result of the physical quantity. So in our previous example of the angular momentum, basically you are then using two axes, the x-axis and the y-axis, each representing one result. This is representing the positive angular momentum, and y-axis represents the minus the negative angular momentum. And how to model the wave particle duality? Here, physicists use something called complex number, which if you don't see it, yeah, bear with me for now. Yeah, but the property is that complex number can, can handle this kind of periodic structure pretty well. It is the mathematical objects that have nice structure that can describe wave very, very well. Yeah, for example, people then can model like Sx plus yeah, uh, using like uh, some combinations of uh, the SZ plus and SZ minus. This will be more clear in a minute, but just to give you the highlight on how people uh, handle wave particle duality. And formally, this new mathematical space, yeah, it is uh, also known as a complex uh, Hilbert space. Yeah, for those who don't know this, yeah, you can just ignore what I said. So basically, yeah, physicists then created a new pure mathematical world for us to try to understand the microscopic world. So moving from the previous phase space of uh, classical mechanics, now we are working on this huge, the dimension is very large, a huge uh, complex Hilbert space. 
in particular, now a physical measurement, for example, the, the previously will be like the angular momentum. It will mathematically corresponding to like uh, something called the orthogonal basis. Yeah, if you don't know the math, you can just imagine it is like this kind of things. Yeah, like uh, they are all perpendicular to each other in the ball. Yeah, each direction corresponding to a possible result. For example, here I use the example of cat. Yeah, if all the result is a possible position posture of cat, yeah, this each x arrow just represents one possible posture. And finally, we also talk about like the evolution, meaning that the change of a, a state, like of your object, is just like a, saying that how like different black things is like moving around, and mathematically the corresponding to rotation. Okay, so this is like the basic setup, the basic worldview, yeah, of uh, quantum mechanics trying to model the world. Especially you can see that because now you model each possible state in the direction, uh, in the dimension or the coordinates of the complex Hilbert space. So this immediate provides you some discreteness, yeah, because like uh, this is like a very discrete, yeah. We don't talk about the the something in the middle yet, yeah. Although immediately you will ask like, okay, so we, we say the, the coordinate vector, the discreteness is like a possible result, but uh, then what is uh, the things they are not a basis vector, not this uh, black things. For example, if Shiva is here, what does it really uh, represent? So this is exact, exactly something known as quantum superposition, which probably most of you heard from popular media. And uh, this is exactly an analogy of waves from uh, classical physics, which then capture the wave particle duality. But to properly uh, explain this, we go back to our uh, complex Hilbert space. But now we just uh, care about two results maybe, which corresponding to the cat sit and the cat, uh, cat lie down. Yeah. And a superposition state could be just a point in the middle which may be represented as this. And this square root of two, just like a normalization things, please feel free to ignore it. Yeah, but we care about what's the physical reality corresponding to the superposition state. Because we know that when we observe a cat, it shouldn't be simultaneously sit and lie. It should uh, just uh, lie in one possible state. Yeah, so the, the mathematical rules physicists then use is through probability theory. It says that if now you are a superposition state, yeah, of like being sit and lying down, you all have health probability determined by these coefficients. Uh, when you measure it, when you look at the cat, it is sitting. And another health probability, when you seeing it, it is lying down. Yeah, so this is like the basic postulate and setting of how to interpret a superposition state. And I just want to emphasize a little bit, this is not a classical probability. And uh, this might not really make sense if you see this for the first time, but I hope like through keep going on and on, on this, you will have more feeling. And we also have advanced section and guest talk on this. And in particular, there are some special forms of uh, superposition that people also always talk about in popular media, which is called quantum entanglement. So these are just a special form of superposition where now maybe we look at four possible uh, situation where your cat, black hat has a friend, a blue, blue cat, and there are four uh, pos pos possibility. And if we look at uh, this special uh, in uh, superposition state on this, and if you just repeat what I described before about like how to interpret the state, actually you will know that there's only a probability, non-zero probability for the cat to be both sit or both lying. Yeah, for all the other uh, possibilities, the, the probability is zero. Yeah, so this is already suggesting that there are some correlation between the black and blue cat if they are in this entangled state. Okay, so hope this gives you a feeling that, okay, there's something going on, yeah, and uh, I also want to emphasize this kind of entanglement is not classical correlations, and this will make more sense in, uh, in a minute. But maybe now is a good time. 
uh, for uh, quick questions. Yeah, or even if, if you don't have concrete questions, maybe pause a little bit and read at uh, these items. Yeah, and I encourage you to think about questions because through asking questions, this also help your own understanding. Yeah, and some questions say, yeah, quantization is related to discrete value. Yes, exactly. Okay, so actually, yeah, this usually will take an hour, but I use like uh, 10 minutes to explain to you so that we can go into something interesting in very, very soon. In particular, now I'm going to give you two examples without uh, detailed proof, yeah, to let you feel the difference and the power of uh, quantumness. The first example is something called a quantum bond tester, where the goal is the probability. I give you a bond. Yeah, it could be a case that bond is live or it is dead, meaning that uh, it's not really working. And it is important for some, I mean, real life situation, you might want to know whether this bond is uh, really alive, otherwise it will hurt people. Yeah, but it's also, I mean, the, the trivial way, I mean, the, the, if you think classically or like uh, the only way to test whether a bomb is live or dead is just to like uh, to see, to, to light it up and see whether it's, it's live or dead, right? So it's like you really need an interaction and this is so dangerous and uh, you can see in the movie and no one probably would really want to risk a life on it. So how can you have an interaction free tester? It seems to be impossible in real life. But actually, it turns out it is possible using quantum superposition through this following uh, bump tester. Yeah, so the idea is to set up things in this way, specifically using superposition. And by some of the simple protocol they design, actually they can show that if the, the bump is, uh, uh, is live, you can still know it with, uh, with uh, like a good confidence and with 50% of a uh, chance, you actually wouldn't like really uh, explode it. Yeah. Meaning that, yeah, this experiment, yeah, if I, I ignore the uh, detailed analysis here, but it promised you mathematically, you can, there's a chance you still know the bomb is live for sure, uh, not for sure, like with very high confidence, but you, are, you didn't really explode it which is really counterintuitive than, than like a, what you would or, originally imagine. Yeah, so I encourage you to maybe go to a website here, I'll post later to, to see what is really going on. Yeah, but uh, for the sake of covering more materials, I don't go into detail here. And the second example to show you the bizarreness of the interestingness of uh, contents is the following CSHASH game. So this is uh, the game where you might be have Alice and Bob, and you also have their kid, Charlie. Yeah, and Charlie want to play again with uh, Alice and Bob, and Charlie first uh, flip two coins, X and Y, to be zero or one, and send it to the, his parent. And he will receive A and B, which is also a zero one value things back. Yeah, and Charlie will be happy, or he will announce uh, his parents win if, the end of the X and Y, he initially threw the flip a coin, equals to the X or of A and B. And I just give a truth table of what do we mean by end and all here, X or here. And uh, so imagine that if you, if the parents can discuss their strategy before seeing like what Charlie uh, gives give them, they maybe can share some classical correlation in the sense that I hear you some coins to decide. It's like, oh, they flip some coins, they decide some strategy. Yeah. And it turns out that mathematically, you can prove that no matter what strategy they use, the, their winning probability is only 75%. But if in the beginning they have some quantum power in the sense that they can share some like a quantum entanglement, which is why I mentioned earlier, then the winning probability can increase to 85. And this is also like a test in real life. And by the way, the previous bomb tester also tests in real life. They, they both work. So we indeed kind of living in a quantum world. 
Okay, so again, I, I, did, I won't prove, uh, provide any details here. And I encourage you actually to look into the map. It's actually quite simple. And some people say, I think it's Feynman probably said, when you encounter uh, quantum mechanics, you just shut up and do the calculations. And indeed, I encourage you to do the calculation to feel like uh, what's the power uh, behind the map. And in our next uh, guest talk by Xin, he will also elaborate on a different perspective in looking at CSH game. Okay, so hope these two examples already give you a feeling on like the bizarreness or the power of quantum comparing to classical mechanics. And I just want to say a few words on the evolution or the changes of quantum state before we go into some exciting things called quantum computing. So if you remember, like previously in classical mechanics, we say, oh, the, the dynamic of a quantum uh, of a classical object on the phase space is like uh, determined by the least energy yeah, path. Yeah. And here, what's the corresponding things in the quantum world? Yeah, and to, to describe this, maybe I just use a simple notation. This is how usually people describe a point, yeah, or like a coordinate uh, on the quantum world. Yeah, and you can also think of it, yeah, classically, this is lens just like rep represent a point on the uh, phase space. So in classical mechanics, we talk about the evolution is dominated by this principle of stationary action. And in the quantum work, actually it's kind of similar, but it's like uh, you need some, some more involved math, but like in principle it's also kind of doing some minimization. Yeah, and uh, in classical mechanics, we say this minimize certain things, single quantity called Lagrangian. And uh, in quantum mechanics, it's also something similar by something known as quantum Hamiltonian. And if you bear with me with those undefined words, yeah, but just look at the symmetry and the beauty of the equation. Yeah, this is what we get like uh, in quantum world. Yeah, the evolution of a quantum state, a point on our complex Hilbert space is then def uh, determined by the Schrodinger equation, which is like a, a beautiful like a differential equations tell you how to, how the, the state going to evolve according to the quantum Hamiltonian. Yeah. So I purposely don't uh, go into detail here. Yeah, please just uh, have a feeling on this. Yeah. Uh, but I, I still give you a bonus on like a different way, maybe a more intuitive way to think about Schrodinger equations or like the evolution of a quantum state in general through this path integration view proposed by I think Feynman. So if you remember like similar to phase space, like in, in in the Hilbert space where quantum mechanics lies in, yeah, you also well face the same question of like a hot path the, the current state will choose to follow. And in classical mechanics, we say it will choose the least energy, least action path. But in quantum, it turns out that it will choose all of the path. Yeah, so rather than just follow a single path, actually, in fact, it I mean, vaguely speaking, it actually follows all path, but just like for each path, you give different weight, yeah, like a different face like uh, on it. And this is exactly corresponding to what we mentioned earlier on superposition. Yeah, so not only a state can be a superposition state, it's like its evolution, actually, you should think of it as a superposition of different possible path. Yeah, so maybe this is a more intuitive picture comparing to Schrodinger's equation, but it's like the Hamiltonian in Schrodinger's equation will tell you like how this, uh, the, the weight of different paths will look like. Yes, and this view will also give you a more intuitive picture on how to think about the wave property of quantum mechanics. Yeah, but yeah, uh, I hope at least your takeaway now is like, okay, quantum mechanic is something talking about uh, the evolution of things in this weird uh, complex Hilbert space. And now things are not determined. It can be superposition of lots of different possibility. So I hope this already provide uh, enough, uh, like at least some terminologies and uh, set up for we to talk about the connection to computing. 
So quantum computing is a world probably uh, we are already being overthrown by the media and the world yeah, uh, nowadays. Yeah, but what it really is and what's the beginning of it? So actually the birth of uh, Feynman's visions on uh, quantum computing, he proposed this, is that he thinks, okay, so now the it seems that uh, uh, the world is governed by quantum mechanics, yeah, because of the lots of experiments, it shows that it indeed has some quantum phenomenon. Yeah, can we have a new type of uh, computing machines that simulate quantum systems? So this is a natural question for physicists if they want to study their physical entity. But for comp computer scientists, maybe we are then thinking that way in the sense that, oh, if now we can simulate quantum system, then this probably suggests that the quantum system can, I mean, uh, like uh, support it, like uh, provide some computation in some form. So maybe there's something we can, can study. Yeah. Can we go beyond just simulating a quantum system and using the power of quantum mechanics to solve some computational problems? that classically or like for a classical Turing machine cannot solve that well. And this further even challenge the extended church Turing thesis, which we will see in a minute. But let's first have a historical view on what's the development beyond just simulating quantum system. So in the beginning, Feynman proposed quantum computing to simulate quantum phenomena. Yeah, but later on, yeah, in order to really study to build a quantum computer, yeah, theoretical computer scientists also started to think about the definition of Turing machine in the quantum, quantum world called quantum Turing machine. And 10 years later, there's a breakthrough in this area uh, by Peter Shaw in MIT. Uh, he discovered that there's an algorithm on quantum Turing machine that can solve some problems which we assume to be difficult in, in a classical Turing machine. And that problem will actually help you to break some cryptographic system, which will endanger the world. So starting from this, people then started to care about the possibility of a quantum computer, because it seems to go beyond just simulating quantum, uh, like a physical uh, phenomenon. It also has some computational uh, ingredient that you can even solve problems theoretically that uh, like a normal Turing machine cannot solve. So people then started to discuss the possibility of uh, quantum computing. In particular, to talk about feasibility, they need to understand if uh, the error in quantum computer can be corrected. Yeah, and there's also a study, uh, new like a field of uh, quantum information, quantum computation, quantum complexity, etc. And recently, there's even some people starting to talk about quantum machine learning. Yeah, so all these are buzzwords. Yeah, but uh, I hope in our amazing guest lectures and the advanced section, people will have more sense. But for now, in this slide, I just want to give you an overview on the 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 selected history development. Yeah, but in the rest of our discussion, which may be just uh, 10 to 10 minutes left, yeah, we will focus a little bit on like what type of task on the high level, like quantum can really do uh, beyond uh, classical mechanics, like what's the new computation insights in the quantum mechanics world. In particular, like uh, also, this is my of interest if people care about reality, like uh, does quantum computer really can be implemented? And if it can be implemented in reality, what type of task it can do well? Yeah. So yeah, as I mentioned earlier, like if we want to cover all the uh, classic example and exciting example, it will take lots of time. So instead, yeah, in the, in the next few slides, I won't talk about specific algorithm or specific computation. Instead, I'll talk about the main paradigms for people to transfer physics to computation. And I'll talk about quantum circuits and quantum adiabatic uh, computation to let you have a feeling on what's the general setup. And I'll let the guest speaker and our advanced sections uh, leaders to talk about how to instantiate these two paradigms. 
So the first paradigm is called quantum circuits, which actually is a quantumization of the Boolean circuits we see before. Yeah, so if you remember, in Boolean circuits, we talked uh, two days, three days ago, the basic uh, elements is like uh, bits, it's a zero one information uh, uh, elements. And in the quantum setting, it is called quantum bits or qubits. Yeah, I won't define here, but just take the terminology. Yeah, so now uh, in the quantum circuits, we then work with uh, lots of uh, qubits and they jointly together called a state. And we have quantum gate, which is like uh, something you can think of is beyond the Boolean like N or X or operations. You have much more choices here. In particular, those choices will create a superposition entanglement, which could potentially be your new ingredient in the computation. And finally, a quantum circuit is then just a simple like a combination of, oh, I have some qubits and I connect them through some quantum gates and it will make a new state out of it. So this is like the first paradigm yeah, of uh, quantum computing. Basically just a quantumization of a classical uh, Boolean circuits. Yeah, so I, I, the, the point here is just to let it have a feeling that, oh, one possibility to discuss computation actually is to put the physics into our normal computational model in uh, the classical mathematics setting. And this will, this will make a drastic uh, comparison to the second example, which is called the adiabatic quantum computation, which instead is to configure computation into a quantum system. Yeah, so instead of like uh, keep applying quantum gates, yeah, like uh, what we did see in the uh, previously, we actually talk about how to configure the Hamiltonian of a quantum state. So if you still recall, like in the last slides, two slides of uh, the introduction of quantum mechanics, we talk about like the evolution of a quantum uh, system is determined by something known as Hamiltonian, which is, you can think of it as just determining the energy, like uh, interaction, like inside the system. In particular, we talk about this uh, Schrodinger's equation tell you how uh, like a quantum uh, state or like this object we care about evolved determined by this Hamiltonian. So in the adiabatic quantum computation, rather than like design lots of gates and then wire them in a specific way, what they did is to design something called local Hamiltonian, which is just a fancy word to say about like, now I design Hamiltonian by like uh, adding up lots of small Hamiltonian for like a small subsystem inside our huge uh, system. Yeah. And uh, another more comfortable way for people who are who see this for the first time, you can just think of it as, okay, computer scientists people have some idea about computation. They translate it into Hamiltonian and embed into a physical system. And some, uh, important theory layer called adiabatic theory tells you that, yeah, if you make the system like evolve properly, then your state will actually goes to the lowest energy state of the Hamiltonian. So in other words, you can think of adiabatic quantum computation as the following. You configure your computational problem into Hamiltonian and analytically you analyze and show that, oh, the, old, the lowest energy state will corresponding to what I want as an output. So I can use the uh, nature of uh, physical evolution determined by quantum mechanics to find the output for me, which is represented as the lowest energy state. So hope like uh, this discussion of the two paradigms at least give you a, a sense of how like uh, you put content in uh, like a traditional CS or you put computation inside your quantum world. And some final words about uh, quantum computer is about uh, the recent hype. Yeah, on quantum advantage, computational advantage is basically like uh, inspired by what we talked uh, briefly mentioned earlier on Schur's algorithm. Uh, it seems that there are some uh, computational problem 
that people believe cannot be done by a uh, classical Turing machine that well. And uh, somehow the quantum algorithm can solve it uh, efficiently. It seems to challenge uh, this extended church Turing thesis, which believe this cannot happen. So there's a race of like building real quantum computers and try to realize some computational tasks that challenge this extended church Turing thesis. And indeed, people are making progress. Yeah, so yeah, so I hope uh, after this lecture or like after you go to a guest lecture, etc., uh, you might uh, get a chance to look at the news and try to see yeah, if that really makes sense to you. And uh, you can, I hope this also clarify your future understanding in the development of uh, like quantum computational advantage. So yeah, as I mentioned earlier, like uh, this is uh, a lot to be covered in like 30, 40 minutes. And I hope uh, this roller coaster ride at least gives you a rough sense on the physical intuition of quantum mechanics, as well as how it connected to computation in certain way. And I also hope this sparkle your interest and so that you can learn more from our guest talks and advanced section. And for now, I'll take a pause. Yeah, let you to think about uh, a little bit on what you heard. Yeah, on those people, like, does it really make sense? Maybe ask a few questions. Yeah, and then we can move on to our last topic, which is about black holes and like uh, gravity. Yeah, but uh, pause a little bit and ask some questions. Yeah. And all the questions will be answered. Uh, and uh, even not right now, but I'll, I'll still try to answer this offline. So, so do ask questions. They, are, they all will be taken care of. Yeah, but maybe not right now due to time limit. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So uh, let's go to the last uh, topics, which is also appear a lot on popular media, which are black holes and gravity. In particular, I want to show, share with you this cute uh, quote by Einstein, who said, black holes are where God is divided by zero. Yeah, this might make some sense if people know what's going on, but for people who don't know, at least my goal today is to convince you that this is a, it's indeed a very fun, funny joke. Okay, so before talking about black hole, I also want to connect with what we talked about before, about like the worldview in the physical world. Yeah, so traditionally, yeah, in all the theory, including quantum theory you see before, they kind of separate space and time. Yeah, they mostly focus on how to provide some interesting geometry of space and talk about evolution on it. And the brilliant starting point of the gravity theory, yeah, is by Minkowski, which is a, a, the teacher of Einstein at the ETH. He unified space and time together and proposed we study them together and call it space time. Math mathematically, you can still think of it as some huge mathematical sub objects in a high dimensional space. And given starting from this insight, yeah, then Einstein learned and worked out his general relativity theory, yeah, which instead of discussing the evolution of a space, it talked about the evolution of the space time. So this is uh, something called Einstein's uh, field equations, yeah, which is exactly tell you how the space time evolved. So it might look scary, but actually let me parse this for you a little bit. The left-hand side actually is some terms. Yeah, actually lots of terms about the curvature of space-time. So it is a geometry objects on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, it is something related to the energy and the momentum of, the, of like uh, this uh, space-time. So the right-hand side is corresponding to matters. So in hindsight, Actually, Einstein's uh, field equations can be summarized as follow. It just tells you that space-time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space-time how to curve. So this is like uh, the, the, the one-page summary of how the, the worldview in like gravity theory or general relativity different from the previous one. So now, 
given this uh, new worldview in a gravity theory, we can now have a new glance on what black holes is. Oh, sorry, black holes are. So this is our Einstein's uh, field equation. It turns out that black holes actually are some mathematical prediction where when Einstein proposed this, other people trying to figure out what's a possible solution of the field equations. And they discover that there are some weird mathematical solution, which is corresponding to something called singularities. And it's, it looks so weird in the sense that they will have very absurd uh, phenomenon and they call it black holes. And if you want to go into details, I encourage you to look a little bit and then you will realize actually black holes is related to something divided by zero inside this equation. Yeah, but here the point of this size, just to clarify a little bit, black holes are something predicted by Einstein's field equations. Yeah, and uh, in the beginning, it is just a prediction. So actually people don't really know whether black hole exists. Yeah, until like uh, some group of people uh, from the previous year, they kind of have these photos, kind of given uh, like indirect evidence that a black hole might exist. Yeah, but to explain why this photo makes sense, maybe we should ask uh, even earlier questions in case people don't know this. Yeah, like why, why we call black hole uh, black? And in fact, it is because when you write down the mathematics of this weird singularity uh, solution, it suggested that the gravity is too large to the extent that even light cannot uh, get out of from it. It means that anything, including light, when it enters the black hole, it will disappear. Yeah, it cannot go out anywhere. Yeah, and since even life cannot uh, escape, it, it will look very black to us because if it is not, not black, it means that there are some light emitted from it. So that's why here people think there might be a black hole here because you can see light around it, but nothing in the middle. Okay, so you might ask, okay, so why should we care about black holes? Yeah, it seems cute, but also bizarre. And what's the matter of it? So a short answer maybe is like, oh, if you care about Einstein's general relativity, you want to see whether this beautiful mathematical theory about space-time is correct. Yeah, the existence of black hole might matter because if it doesn't exist or if it's wrong, it probably suggests that there's something wrong about the Einstein's uh, theory. So that's why like having this indirect uh, evidence is so important. But then you maybe also ask, okay, so now that uh, scientists already like uh, maybe have a belief that, okay, black holes indeed uh, exist in some sense, but uh, what, why care? Yeah, what's next? So it turns out that even though I said like uh, theoretically, this is uh, the first question people will ask, but it turns out that in theoretical physics, there are much more questions and all like uh, rooted from black holes. In particular, there are some paradoxes or puzzles that really came coming from the bizarreness of black holes as a mathematical solutions. So in short, those paradox and puzzles usually are coming from some mathematical like uh, arguments or thought experiments. And that's the place where computation will come up. But to give you a feeling in the rest of the five minutes, yeah. Let me use a simple example about one famous paradox. Yeah, to convince you that later on computation actually plays some roles in black holes. So this example is something called information paradox. And it is actually very related to another important uh, modern physics figure called Stephen Hawking. So one of uh, Stephen Hawking's uh, uh, important work is the discovery that although light cannot go inside to, uh, cannot escape from black holes, but black holes will evaporate, meaning that uh, in, I mean, intuitively, you should think of it literally evaporate some, some, some energy or some, some stuff out. But in the meantime, through more mathematical uh, like uh, analysis, 
Hawking, uh, Hawking discovered something like, oh no, wait, this uh, evaporation also suggests that information will also lost. So what do I mean by information? For example, like you think of a cat jumping inside the black hole. So the cat itself is some like a real entity and it has some information in the sense that we know so much about it. And if we go to a black hole, in the end, black hole will only evaporate something out. And from this, another uh, important uh, theory of black holes called the no hair theory, it says that what uh, emitted or what we can understand of black holes is only about the macroscopic parameters, which is like uh, what we discussed in the statistical mechanics part. It just depends on some global structure rather than the small details. So it is saying that although there's a beautiful cat jump into a black hole, it is a non-trivial object. It contains lots of information. But after the black hole evaporates, yeah, that inf information kind of disappear because the information like, uh, like uh, from the evaporation can only depend on the microscopic structure of the black hole. However, if you look at quantum theory, although we didn't go into detail, but uh, if you trust me, I'll tell you in quantum theory, information actually would, shouldn't lost, shouldn't be lost. Yeah, because of like the, the evolution yeah, of the quantum theory actual guarantee, your information can be recovered in some way. Yeah, but according to the no hair series here about the microscopic uh, uh, parameter decides the black hole and Hawking's radiation, it seems that uh, gravity theory suggests information can, lost, can be lost. So it raised the question of does uh, information really lost? And in particular, how to unify quantum and gravity? Because quantum theory tell you information wouldn't lose and gravity like a series suggest it might. So finally, this comes to the computational aspects of uh, gravity and black holes. Yeah, so in order to tackle this kind of uh, information paradox, this is just one example. People have proposed many, many solutions and recently, there are some solution proposed through the lens of a computation. And in particular, those proposal kind of view black holes as some computational objects, computational models such as information scramblers. Yeah, intuitively, just something like the mix, mix things and make it looks very random. Or people also view black holes as something called error correction code. This is also some computational object. I cannot have time to, I don't have enough time to describe here, but just to feel, give you a feeling that there are some fancy computational models that where physicists suggest that uh, black holes might be related to. And they are all serving as some potential candidates to like explain the paradox we see in the previous slides. So I probably should pause here a little bit, yeah, um, because to probably explain this will actually take a lot of time. In particular, I really want to get, give a right, uh, like, a argument on it. So if you are interested in this, please uh, tell me in the survey tomorrow, yeah, so that I'll decide if I'm going to prepare an advanced section on this next week. So yeah, so that's the part about black hole. And before we end this, uh, this lecture, let me use 30 seconds to review what we have seen in the past two lectures and to connect everything together. So we saw that uh, Newton's basically provides us a way to think about the world in a three-dimensional Euclidean space. So like the computation done by uh, Newton's law basically is some mechanics and some local rules applies in a three-dimensional Euclidean space. And in classical mechanics, we move to phase space and we know that physical world will choose the least energy direction. So it's kind of like optimization. And the statistical mechanics corresponding to this kind of a priori probability from observing microstate referring microstate. So this corresponding to other computational aspects like sampling. 
And the quantum world we see uh, today is like uh, now postulate the world being a complex Hilbert space. And the gravity theory talk about space time. Yeah, like unify space and time as a single mathematical object. So in summary, uh, today we talk about, quickly talk about the setup of uh, quantum mechanics as a different worldview. And we also go through like a two examples or like two paradigms of how people connect computation to quant quantum, especially they are in like different direction. The first is like uh, using quantum is inside classical like uh, computation model, or the second is more like embedding computation into quantum system. And we also hint a little bit about the potential connection of computation to gravity. So finally, yeah, just uh, want to let you know, we have uh, two great uh, guest talks on like uh, topics related to quantum computation. And since they are all talking about their frontier research, so actually the recording won't be public. So, so please come if you are interested in that. And we also have our amazing uh, our teaching staff talking about lots of uh, diverse topics related to this. In particular, Eric, is going to talk about uh, information geometry this afternoon. So you all are welcome to join too. And I guess I'll also uh, post here, yeah, for some food for thought and exercise for you. And I also put these questions in on Discord so that people can discuss there. Okay, so thanks you for your attention. And I guess this is the end of um, uh, this lecture. Thank you.